Hello folks, welcome back. This is Professor Watts again, and today we're going to talk about demand, supply, and equilibrium. So let's jump right in with the law of demand. Demand slopes down, it's really that simple. A technical definition, there's an inverse relationship between the price of a good and the quantity that people will buy, the quantity demanded. As the price of a good goes up, people buy less of it. It's a lower quantity purchased, and as the price goes down, people buy more of it. It's a higher quantity purchased. This is, a, this is always the case. This is really the case for all goods at all times. Okay, so let's actually start drawing. I like to pick an actual product and an actual market area, even if it's a made up area, as in this case. You'll notice that we have a fully specified demand situation here. So the, so the product, the location, the price per unit, and the quantity per time period. And you really need all these things to have a proper demand and supply diagram, but we have them all. And we'll just draw in kind of a generic downward sloping demand curve. And it's not important at this stage to have this exactly right because we're just using the concept of demand and supply to think about, in general, price movements. Okay, and I'll give us a situation where price rises from 250 to $4, quantity declines from 10 to 8,000 gallons. That's the law of demand at work. As the price goes up, people buy less. Notice our terminology here. When price rose, what changed? Quantity. The quantity that people purchased declined from 10 to 8,000. We don't say demand changed. Demand is this demand curve. In fact, we should label it here maybe something like demand one. And that didn't change. That's still there. We just moved along that demand curve from, the, from point A to point B. Let's think about why we're making this move. Well, as the price goes up, we have substitution happening. People buy less of this good because it's too expensive likely going to uh, buy more of other goods. So they're substituting out of a, a more expensive good and into alternative goods. So we might be buying less milk and with our grocery money, our food money, maybe we're buying more orange juice. Okay, so there's substitution as price increases. Now, let's think about the opposite case where price decreases. Now it goes from four to 250 and then the quantity goes up from eight to 10,000 gallons per week. Again here, what happened to demand? As the price decreased, what happened to demand? Nothing happened to demand. The demand curve is still there, D1. What changed is the quantity, which went from eight to 10,000. We went from point A on this demand curve to point B on this demand curve. This is the technical term for what's happening here is diminishing marginal value. As price decreases, extra units become less and less valuable. And you think about if um, milk were extremely cheap, if it were a dollar a gallon, 50 cents, a dime a gallon, how much would you buy? Well, there's a finite amount. You, you'll notice that this demand curve is going to intersect the um, quantity axis at a price of zero. There's a finite amount of milk you can buy. There's a finite amount you can take home from the store. There's a finite amount you can you can store in your refrigerator. The, the biggest limiting factor is how much could you actually use? Okay. Nobody wants to drink 20 glasses of milk a day. I'm I see you're drinking 1%. Is that because you think you're fat? Because you're not. You could be drinking whole if you wanted to. As price goes down, quantity increases, but only to a point. Extra units become less and less valuable. Okay, so there's a demand curve in the law of demand. Now let's talk about dynamics. A change in the price of a good does not change demand for that good. Price changes, as we just discussed, the quantity will go up and down along a given demand curve. Price changes, quantity changes. To change the entire demand curve, changing demand, we have to have something other than the price of this good shifting. And that's what we get into what's called determinants of demand. Okay, so first up is income. And there's two effects income can have. And for a normal good, as your income goes up, your demand goes up. And as your income goes down, your demand goes down. So um, a classic one might be cars. Now, you, you don't necessarily buy more cars, but you definitely will spend more on transportation. You'll, you'll spend more on your car as your income goes up. And there's a category called inferior goods where as your income goes up, your demand actually goes down. You can kind of think about here, it's kind of like a substitution out of an entire category of good and you're shifting up to, to something that you perceive as better. There's a classic example of an inferior good. Normal and inferior are just category labels. They don't have any, we're not trying to say anything about people's choices. We don't do that in economics. Values are subjective, although we will comment on or, or maybe critique people's values from a standpoint of ethics or, or morals or, or the law from within pure economics, these are just kind of observational categories, no value judgment implied. Okay, so we have income, we have the price of other goods. The key word here is other goods. The price of, of the good itself changes when the price of milk changed, what happened to demand? Nothing happened to demand, we just had a quantity change. But here, when the price of other goods change, that can influence the level of demand for, for a particular good. 
And that can be one of two categories. Substitutes, the price of X goes up, demand for Y goes up, because Y is a substitute for X. So basically what we're saying here is that if X is getting more expensive and Y is a substitute, so I can use Y to satisfy the same kind of wants that, that X satisfies, well, I'll, I'll want to buy more Y because X is becoming more expensive. Likewise, if X gets cheaper, the price of X goes down. I'm less interested in Y as a substitute, so demand for Y goes down. Notice that direct relationship between price of one and demand for the other. Now here's an example, beef and chicken. The price of beef is rising, demand for chicken rises, or vice versa. If the price of chicken rises relative to beef, demand for beef rises. Goods could also be complements to each other. Go, they go together. They're, they're used together in consumption. So in this case, if the price of A rises, demand for B declines because you're using less A, the, the quantity demanded of A goes down. And if you're using less A, you're using less B because A and B are used together. Likewise, if the price of A goes down, demand for B goes up. Now your price of A goes down, people are consuming more of it, and they're going to go ahead and buy more B as well. Notice that now that we have an inverse relationship between the price of one and demand for the other. The classic example here, peanut butter and jelly often go together. So if peanut butter becomes less expensive, people will probably buy more of it, and then they'll probably buy some more jelly because uh, they're going to be making some more... Uh, PBJs. Here's a kind of a real life example of that, and this is something I observed several years ago. And uh, don't get too excited about that gas price. It's not a dollar seventy per gallon. That's actually 1.7 Swiss francs per liter. This is over in Switzerland, and that works out roughly to six dollars a gallon based on the exchange rate at the time. Europe has has long had very expensive gas in comparison to the U.S. and most of that, frankly, is because they have really high taxes. But regardless, they have a very high gas price, six dollars per gallon, and that's it's going to be something double, triple U.S. gas prices. So go ahead and, and be an economist and make a prediction about how this is going to impact their uh, consumption of related goods. Think about what kind of cars they're going to drive. Here's an example of a very small European car. And this one's an old one. This one's a 1950s one. So they've had high gas prices for a long time. They've driven small cars for a long time. Now, gas and cars are complements. So people are using less gasoline because the price is really high. They're probably going to be using fewer cars. And because small cars substitute for large cars, and it's expensive to operate large cars, they're probably going to be, of the cars they do operate, they're going to be smaller cars. It's a car I rented over there, smallest car I've ever driven. I had this thing up to about 100 miles an hour on the autobahn. It was pretty, uh, it's pretty exciting. And it, even at that, I was still being blown away by Mercedes and Audis and and so on. So we've got income. We've got the price of other goods, substitutes, complements, tastes and preferences. Tastes and preferences really a catch-all category. We don't bother much with really trying to understand this. That's a matter for for psychology. But we basically chalk up anything that's not one of the other determinants of demand. We can chalk that up to tastes and preferences. And I'll just give a quick example here based on music taste changing over time. So this is something my grandparents' generation uh, really grew up with and listened to. Uh, when I was a kid, this is what was popular at the time. Here's something that's popular now. God forbid my kids are listening to it. Uh, here's something that, that was popular and, and remained popular, but then had a sudden surge in its popularity and demand, and it was observable because of the unfortunate, uh, untimely death of Michael Jackson. <laughs> So we actually observed that. Here's some uh, news clippings I got from, from websites from right after he died unexpectedly back in 09. And you'll see that notes here that the demand source for Jackson Music at Jackson Item Store and Value. Now, what's going on? Well, we could say there's a pretty clear-cut shift in demand, and this is based on a change in taste and preferences, and it's kind of uh, based on this swelling of nostalgia for these items uh, right after he died. Okay, let's say we're looking at the market for the, the genuine vintage albums. And we'll say that currently they're, they're selling for about $10 each, and there's 500 a month changing hands. What happens after, after his sudden death increases the, the nostalgia? Well, there's a shift in demand, D2. So now the entire demand curve, notice, is at a higher level. And let's pause for a second to think about what that means. At any price, 
That means people will buy more than they previously bought. That's what higher demand means. So that at the old price, they might buy something like a thousand, or at any quantity, they're willing to pay a higher price. So so to buy 500 now, they'd be willing to pay 25 dollars each. And the, I'm just making up the numbers. It's it's doesn't have to be very accurate at this point. It just has to reflect the actual pattern of change we observed. And this is exactly what we did observe in these news stories here. Note that there's a fixed supply of the genuine vintage albums. It can't make more of those, so the supply curve is fixed here at 500. And therefore, the, pr the adjustment has to be strictly a price adjustment. And we talk about new albums. New albums could be reproduced at a pretty constant uh, marginal cost. So what we might see there is strictly an increase in quantity at the same price. Okay, expectations. Estimation of the future value of a good changes. That shifts demand for the product today. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty observable phenomenon uh, before, during, and after hurricanes. You see shifts of demand for certain articles that become extremely useful, both in preparing for a storm and cleaning up after a storm. Uh, here's one. How about demand for ammo and, and canned food and the, if we are expecting a zombie apocalypse? Well, if you really are expecting a zombie apocalypse, you know that when it hits, though, these goods will be scarce and hard to come by, so you want to stock up on them now, like this guy is doing. Okay, this guy's ready. This guy's going all out. I'm not too worried about this phenomenon, so I'm not uh, investing a lot of money into uh, canned food, ammo, and, and, and sleeping bags and such. Uh, hey, he's, at least he's putting his money where his mouth is, right? Okay, finally, the number of consumers, and this one's pretty straightforward. It's if you add consumers, if a uh, population of your region grows, demand for uh, products grows along with it. There's a determinants of demand. Now, uh, a little device to help you remember is uh, I've rearranged the order a little bit and you can see that you take the first letters here and you've got a little acronym determinants of demand you can remember those through the acronym type T-I-P-E number so remember type number is the determinants of demand tastes and preferences incomes price of other goods expectations number of consumers so remember that type number those are your determinants of demand those are the things that would shift the level of the demand curve up or down so we'd be drawing a brand new demand curve we're moving it up and to the right or down to the left and then after we have supply in place and we talk about equilibrium we'll start doing practice problems where we're well i give where i give you a scenario and you'll have to decide is it a demand shifter or a supply shifter well you'll want to remember these factors and think through the scenario and decide is one of these factors operable in the scenario and I will give you examples and we'll do a lot of practice of those scenarios down the road so that'll wrap it now for demand the next lesson will cover the determinants of supply and then after that we'll bring the demand curve and the supply curve together and talk about price formation and equilibrium so stay tuned I'll see you soon